Mother Earth doesn't need us, but we absolutely need her. Like, we can't live without Mother Earth, but she can live without humans. And, you know, when we think about the power that nature carries, I feel like it removes that whole idea of conquering. Rachel Heaton hails from the Muckleshoot tribe in the Pacific Northwest. She lives and works on her reservation about an hour away from the base of Tahoma, the mountain commonly known as Mount Rainier. We'll refer to it as Tahoma for the remainder of the episode. About five years ago, when Rachel was in her early 40s, she started hiking and mountaineering. She fell in love with being out on the trail, and it brought her even closer to her land and her people. In 2023, Rachel organized the first all-Native team to climb the mountain. I'm Shelby Stanger, and this is Wild Ideas Worth Living, an REI Co-op Studios production. In 2017, Rachel Heaton's world turned upside down. Alongside thousands of others, she went to Standing Rock Reservation in North and South Dakota to protest against the U.S. government's Dakota Access Pipeline. The experience was intense, and when Rachel came home, she struggled to go back to her day-to-day life. She became depressed, quit her job of 20 years, and then found out that she was unexpectedly pregnant. Rachel already had two teenage children at home, and she thought she was done having kids. I had this new baby again, and I'm like, how do I, how, how do I, like, continue to, like, have this lifestyle and be able to go to the gym? Because that was my go-to for my mental health. And I had just started working in our culture department when he was about six months old. And so I was, I was having to go outside regularly and harvest plants and medicines and, Um, I was thinking like, hey, I can take the baby and thinking of it in the gym sense, he will be my resistance and hiking will be my cardio and that will be like going to the gym. So it started off with just kind of these basic little hikes. Our first one was only a mile long. And I remember packing a little backpack and not really knowing what to put in it and then having him on a pack. And um, for me, hiking brought peace. Like I found peace out there. And I really started noticing how much I enjoyed the solitude and the healing that was coming from it. And I heard a question one day, and it was kind of one of those aha moments. And the question was, and I think at this time, I was really trying to search of like, what am I going to do for a career at this point? I just quit my job. I'd been in it for 20 years. I hadn't been doing these other things besides organizing and 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 being on the front lines. But I was like, what am I going to do? And I heard this question, when you're looking for your purpose, go back to what made you happy in your childhood and do that for a job. And, and, and so of course, like you could really dig into that, but I really thought about it. I'm like, what made me happy when I was a kid? And so like really digging deep, I'm like, I was always happy outside. Like if I was happy outside, it meant I wasn't in trouble. I wasn't doing something wrong. Um, I wasn't, you know, getting hurt. Like there was, you know, none of those, I wasn't being bullied. I was happy. And so it really resonated with me. Like being outside really makes me happy. And it calms me and it heals me. And I do really good alone in those spaces. And so that's what hiking brought to me is it brought this form of peace that I didn't know, one, I was looking for, and two, I didn't know it was available. In 2021, Rachel signed up to climb Tahoma with a local guiding company. As she trained for the expedition, Rachel realized that a lot of the culture around mountaineering is focused on reaching the summit. But Rachel was interested in approaching her climb in a different way. Instead of conquering the mountain and making it to the very top, she wanted to use her time on Dahoma to build her relationship with the land. The name Tahoma. Mm-hmm. Can you talk to me about it and the meaning? So there's six tribes around the base of Rainier. But when you go further back in history, there weren't tribes. We were villages. So when you envision this mountain, imagine hundreds of villages around this mountain. And so then those villages had to come together, you know, through, you know, colonization and things. And so then those hundreds of villages became six tribes. And so they're all, we're all placed around the mountain. And so actually, 
each of those tribes have their own name for the mountain. Um, Takobud is the one that our community um, specifically uses. So you'll hear Takobet, Takobud, Takoma. Um, and so there's different words for it, but Tahoma kind of encompasses all of that. It's kind of more of a common um, way for people to, I guess it's kind of like the English derivative of some of those words. And so Tahoma more reflects the um, native indigeneity of the mountain. And Rainier is actually just um, the name that was given to the mountain about 200 you know, years ago. And it was by, I believe it was Governor Stevens. And what he did was he named it after a friend. He was just like, oh, hey, Rainy Pierre Rainier was his name. And he actually never saw the mountain or anything. He's his friend just named it after him. And that's like the westernized, you know, way that has, you know, taken on the mountain. And also too, like in westernized thinking, you know, I think we look at nature as, like you said, as this means to conquer. And the reality is, is as humans, we don't own earth. And, you know, when we think about the power that nature carries, I feel like it removes that whole idea of conquering. You know, when we look at Mother Earth as a provider, when we think of the water and we think about the plants and our animal relatives, like those are all things that are provided for us. But this you know, historical, westernized, patriarchal, you know, it, 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 it's raised us in this world of like, we have to conquer something. But when you allow yourself to go out into spaces, and I remember the first time I climbed, I had to turn around and um, I, I attempted twice last year and in that process of climbing. Um, and it wasn't because of the mountain. It was because my pack was too heavy and I was going to basically hold the team behind. And I had to make a decision to turn around. And I remember my ego was shattered and um, it was a wake up call because I got down to the bottom of the mountain. My boyfriend picked me up and I was devastated. And he literally looked over at me and was like, I don't know you. Like, what? what is going on with you? Like, this isn't you. And I remember he took me home. And I didn't want to go home. <laughs> I wanted to just, like, pout and hide. And then I was going to ask you if, like, when you're <laughs> in these moods, do you pout? Because, like, when my ego is crushed, I kind of act like a 12-year-old, like, oh, or I even younger. I did. Got it. Yes, okay. I totally did. And I had to go home, and I really had to sit and think about it. And I'm like... Why is my ego so involved in this? Why am I devastated? And it's because in the process of like getting ready for that climb, I never imagined not making it. I never imagined that that was even going to be a possibility. It wasn't even something that crossed my mind. And so then when it happened, it was shocking. But then I had to like humble myself and go, wait a second. That's not why you're going out there. You're not going out there to summit. You're going out there to, to teach people. You're going out there to let them know that Native people are still here, that you walk by our traditional plants and our medicines all the time, and you have no idea the beauty that you're surrounded by. You have no idea the spiritual connection that this land holds when you walk on it. And so it just gets looked at as a tourist location, or it gets looked at as, you know, this place that needs to be explored and conquered. And I was just like, wait, that's exactly what I don't want people to come up here and think that this is about. So then the more that I started getting out there, I realized like, holy cow, our people aren't out here. Like we're not, we're not visible in this space. We're not, um, I don't see us out there. And so then that really got me thinking like our language isn't out there. Our knowledge isn't out there. We're not out there. But we're ancestrally from these lands. Like, why do I not see my face, like, at all on this mountain? And so um, so then it became this mission of, like, how do I get our voice out onto this mountain? Or how do I get us out there? And so I ended up going back to the climbing company that I was uh, climbing with at the time. And I sat down with the owner of that that company. And, and I told him, like... Um, my reason for going up there. And it was about creating visibility for our people. And it was about introducing our medicines. And it was about, you know, taking medicines to the mountain and, and letting her know, like, 
you know, we are here and we understand the power that you carry. And it's our job to educate the people that come out here and experience you. Um, And so they, by that afternoon, he had connected me with their climbing manager and everything. And they had actually had me on a climb, you know, two months later. And I get to you know, have the opportunity to educate outsiders about the sacred space that they're actually in and, you know, the villages of the tribes that surround that mountain I get to talk about. And yeah, that's that's really what, what it's about for me. By day, Rachel works in the cultural department for the Muckleshoot tribe, collecting indigenous herbs, seeds, and plants to share with her community. As she became more involved in mountaineering, Rachel figured out a way to bring her work on the reservation up to Tahoma. She started carrying food and teas from local tribes on expeditions to share with visiting mountaineers. Soon enough, Rachel was presented with the opportunity to put together the first all-Native team to climb Tahoma. When we come back, Rachel talks about how this expedition came together, what it was like to actually train for the climb, and we even hear voice memos that the team recorded while on the mountain. In 2022, Rachel started working with a guiding company and sharing her native culture with climbers on Tahoma, also known as Mount Rainier. Her work was so impactful that the Washington Parks Fund took notice. They offered to sponsor the first all-Native expedition on Tahoma, and they asked Rachel to organize it. She recruited seven climbers from tribes all over the Northwest. Most of them didn't have much mountaineering experience, but they were all eager to form a deeper relationship with their native land. The team prepared for months and planned to set out the first week of September, 2023. I talked to Rachel six weeks before the team left on their expedition. How are you guys preparing for it? So um, everybody kind of lives in different areas of Washington. uh, And so everybody kind of is on their own for their training. However, um, you know, the really cool thing about the climbing companies is they all have like tools of like how to specifically train for a mountain because training for a mountain is absolutely nothing like training for bodybuilding for me. (laughs) So, um, but we do have practices of training practices to expose the climbers to the environment that they're going to be in and just giving them an idea of like what to expect when we get out on this climb. And it also gives us a chance to talk about like, hey, how are you feeling? Where are you at? I personally this time around got a custom program to train and I've been using that program uh, for the last several months to get myself ready. Any good stories so far from some of those practice climbs that you can share? Um, You know, our first climb was really great because it's funny. A lot of our team thought like, well, I'm a great hiker, so that will make me a great climber. And, And it's crazy because they're so different when you bring in the snow and the technical piece. And so the first practice that we all did together, we all hiked up to the base camp, uh, Camp Murr, which is where we will all be for the first night. And it was a big learning experience of like some of the climbers realizing like I have to have certain medications. So realizing like what are the absolute things you have to have with you? And some of my climbers have anxiety. So it was super important to make sure that they have that. Um, We have our younger ones that have just like endless energy and just like the energy that they bring. Like that's the cool thing is like our group is everyone like from their early 20s to, you know, our 40s. And everybody just brings this different level of of energy. But uh, yeah, and we all have great chemistry and we're all just very different and we recognize it. And that and the mountain taught us that like being out there as a group and how that support plays. But it was a very big learning lesson. Um, Some of us didn't have the right boots. Some of us didn't have our medications. We burned really, really bad. I mean, we were putting sunscreen on all day long and we still fried. So it was just kind of like these learning things that you would not want to learn on the official climb. So these practices have been really great. What kind of indigenous knowledge and practices are you taking with you on this climb? So, um... Definitely 
uh, with this particular climb, because everybody with me is Native, so it's not so much about educating others about where they're at um, as much as it is about us enjoying who we are as Native people and, and enjoying that connection to the land and each of us understanding that connection that we have as Native people. So that's important, but also to you know, having our traditional medicines and plants with us is important to me because, you know, that mountain's alive and she knows that we're bringing those things there. And so when my team, you know, comes together and starts climbing, we all gather and we give, you know, an offering to the mountain. So we lay tobacco out and, um, you know, we, we all say a prayer, you know, before we, you know, go into that setting and introduce ourselves because she knows we're there. And so we, we take that with us, but then the opportunity to go up and, you know, and smudge and, and clear those spaces and just, I, I feel like bringing that medicines, you know, to her, you know, which is the mountain. And, um, yeah, so just then I think just taking who we are as native people up there and that experience is really what I'm taking with this. Rachel has spent a lot of time up on Tahoma. So she can tell when something doesn't feel right. On a hiking trip in August of this year, Rachel noticed that it was hot up on the mountain. The snow was melting and conditions were icier than normal. By early September, most trips to Tahoma were canceled because it was unsafe to summit. But Rachel and her team were determined to move forward even if they couldn't make it to the top of the mountain. Here are voice memos from some of the team members before they left for their expedition. My name is Jennifer Vickers. Uh, my Nipmuc name is Nipiui Tenequiquas. I reside on the Coast Salish lands here in Edmonds, Washington. This has been a bucket list adventure for me for about three years. And, you know, and once you put things into the air and manifest things, you know, they somehow in some way become real. Um, we've always talked about, you know, what representation is missing and it's such a rich opportunity of learning and development for everyone that um, enters these spaces. Hi, my name's Gil Adami and I'm from the Mokoshi Indian tribe. Part of the, the reason why I'm doing this climb is because to show my kids, no matter what age they are, you know, not to give up. This is not something that was in my plans. I felt like I wasn't even supposed to be here, but I feel like my kids will watch this and, you know, other people will watch this and hopefully, you know, spark their mind to get into places like this. My name is Stephen Gray. I'm Nooksack and Seabird Island. Going into the climb, I'm feeling pretty anxious. I can only imagine how tested we will be both physically and mentally. I'm a little worried about trying to stay as present as possible when I'm sure your feet, your legs, hips, things are just like on fire. But then I think those are those moments where you kind of try and tap into that gratitude of sharing the space and the air of, you know, the group and our ancestors. The team hiked with a guiding company up to Camp Muir, which is one of the base camps at Tahoma. It sits at almost 11,000 feet, and getting up there is no small trek. After they made it to Camp Muir, the team was committed to continuing up the mountain. But as they made their way toward a higher camp, the group ran into several rock falls. Their guide told them, sometimes the mountain whispers, but today she is shouting. It was clear that it wasn't safe to go any further, and they needed to return to a lower elevation. In total, the team spent three days on the mountain. They did technical exercises like getting lowered into crevasses and navigating ice fields. Here are some messages from the actual climb. Hoxla hail, Rita Gray, Sitsta, hello, this is Rita Gray. I am at Camp Mirror with my lovely indigenous hiking team. And we are getting ready to head out this morning. 
and I am just feeling really grateful to be a part of such an amazing group of people and to be a part of this monumental moment and just really, really grateful to be here. I'm also really tired. I've had a lot of anxiety since being up here. I think that my community would be really proud of me for being a part of a group that's reclaiming Indigenous spaces and just paving the way for Indigenous folks to get out there and mountaineer and reclaim those spaces. Final day up here on Mount Tahoma. I have so many complaints. Like, it's pretty chilly. We didn't even get to make it to the flats after all the tough training and the excruciating first day to Murr. Hold on, I can't breathe. <laughs> Surprisingly, my body doesn't feel too sore, but I seriously had to reteach myself how to breathe. <laughs> if you can't tell. Uh, now, I know there's a lot of negative, but it's kind of the raw truth. The crazy part, though, is none of that even matters to me. It's so breathtaking up here. And even if we only got as high as Murr, the views day and night are immaculate. So just being able to be up here and absorb the beauty and energy is such a blessing. We got lucky and are up here alone, so it's peaceful and quiet. Plus the people that are up here with me make it a million times better. Our laughter just echoes off the mountains up here. All in all, 100 out of 10 would recommend and will be doing again. Stephen Gray, last morning here. I am feeling pretty good. I'm excited to be going down, that's for sure. But I've had a great time. Just the peace and the quiet of being at Camp Muir by ourselves was, I mean, made the trip. You know, just because there's so much chaos and activity going on beneath the clouds and up where we were, it's us, one raven, Mount Hood, Mount St. Helens, Mount Adams. You know, when things are feeling crazy and things are, you know, feeling overwhelming, just being able to call back on this moment of being above the clouds and, and the peace that comes with that. So for me, it's just it's just continuing to be myself and and do things that I find to be of value. So looking forward to, you know, being able to reflect and, and, and see the impact that this trip has. While they weren't able to reach the peak of Tahoma, the group achieved their goal to connect with Mother Nature. Rachel only hopes that this approach to adventure and representation makes a lasting impact. The team may not want to like do this as like a lifelong thing. Like they're not necessarily looking to be mountaineers. Um, I, I hope that this isn't a one-time thing. Even if it's not this team, I don't want this to be a one-time thing because it's not just a visibility issue here. It's a visibility issue everywhere. And so that's, that's what I hope comes from this. This all-Native climb was hopefully the first of many opportunities, projects, and initiatives that support Native climbers and adventurers. Rachel, Mercedes, Gil, Taylor, Jennifer, Stephen, and Rita, congrats on your climb. Thank you so much for coming on Wild Ideas Worth Living and sharing your experiences with us. Wild Ideas Worth Living is part of the REI Podcast Network. It's hosted by me, Shelby Stanger, Produced by Annie Fassler, Sylvia Thomas, and Sam Piers Nitzberg of Puddle Creative. And our senior producer is Jenny Barber. Our executive producers are Paolo Motola and Joe Crosby. As always, we love it when you follow the show, when you rate it, and when you take time to write a review. And remember, some of the best adventures happen when you follow your wildest ideas. I'm excited to share that Camp Monsters, another podcast from REI Co-op Studios, is back for season five. Camp Monsters shares stories of spooky encounters with creatures in the wildest corners of North America. This season, they're encountering the shadow outside your window on a stormy evening. 
sounds inside the wall above your bed late at night, and the strange shape you notice just behind you in that photo. I've heard a sneak peek of the episodes, and I gotta say, I think it's their best season yet. So gather a few friends around the fire, grab a blanket and a flashlight, and tune into Camp Monsters wherever you listen to podcasts.